Hey, Elda. Hi, Cindy. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Cindy McLaughlin. I'm the CEO of Envelope. We're a tech company that built the wildly complex zoning code of New York City, which is a 4,300 page legal document into 3D software to be able to visualize, calculate, and run scenarios on real estate development potential under all of its spatial constraints. So it's kind of like SimCity for real life. Uh, indeed. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, I'm Eldad, Director of Zoning Services at Envelope. And um, zoning, which is my area of expertise, is an incredibly important and powerful aspect of our cities. It really is sort of like the DNA of the code of our cities. Um, but it is too often wrapped in a shockingly boring, complicated, hard to penetrate, usually paper-based shell. Um, and so we are trying to unwrap those layers a little bit to better understand how we can improve our cities. Uh, this past year, 2020, has obviously been a disaster on multiple fronts, but um, these crises also present opportunities. And this is an opportunity to reset, uh, to rethink some of the things that weren't working before uh, and to break from the past and to recover in ways and plan for a better future uh, in ways that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. That's right. So today we're going to talk about some ideas for New York City, which is our own backyard, um, and how we can think about building back better post-pandemic. Um, for starters, the idea that inspired me, certainly, and I think a lot of us in 2020, was the concept of the 15-minute city. Uh, the idea was developed by a guy named Carlos Moreno, who is a professor of innovation and complex systems at the Sorbonne in Paris, and was uh, subsequently implemented by Anne Hidalgo, who's the incredible mayor of Paris. Um, the idea is now spread to urban planners around the world and is, uh, shall we say, the talk of the town. So Cindy, you were super uh, early on in the band bandwagon of the 15 minute city. Um, you were a champion of it for a long time now. And um, what is it about it that kind of caught your eye and why is it so interesting to you? And you think, why is it catching on now? Yeah, so the idea is very simple and it's beautifully simple. Um, the idea is that every resident of a city should be within a 15 minute walk or bike ride to almost anything they need to thrive. So this means that they can walk to work, they can walk to school, they can walk to get care for their kids or themselves. They can walk to parks and recreation, to daily shopping, to essential services. So, you know, the idea is that everybody can live in a complete neighborhood, kind of like a village within the city. It's particularly compelling in pre-industrial cities like New York, which is already structured as a series of fairly complete neighborhoods already. Um, I personally love the idea because I love to walk the city. You know, I'm a, I'm, it, it's how I get my exercise and it's how I can breathe and think. Um, and it's kind of fundamentally a healthy way to live. So um, for me, in New York City, the lockdown kind of revealed the idea uh, because for you know all of a sudden, we weren't so sure about the safety of taking the subway and we couldn't get to the office even if we wanted to. Um, it, you know, it sort of took some doing <laughs> with our mayor, but we eventually closed some streets to cars opened them up to shops and restaurants. We ultimately removed a bunch of parking spaces and um, we opened our streets in a way that we could suddenly feel like what it would mean to live in a city where you could walk to anything that you needed. Right, so, we, were, we were forced into some of these choices but they revealed themselves to be actually pretty desirable. That's right. I mean, there was a moment when the sky was as blue as it's ever been. You could see the stars, the streets were quiet, the birds were loud. Um, you know, air was tasted like air uh, uh, instead of like car exhaust. 
And we sort of built this sense memory for what it would feel like to live in a truly green city. And it was frankly pretty incredible. And I wanted to get back there. It really was. So, you know, the, the, the fundamental idea of the 15 minute city is to dramatically reduce the amount of time people spend in transit while improving their health and quality of life. Um, if you imagine that transit, I think in New York, the statistic is that it's about 30% of the carbon emissions of New York City comes from vehicle transit. So if we can reduce the amount of time we spend in transit, um, which, you know, it, it hastens the progress toward the city's goal of being carbon neutral. And then it becomes a framework that we can use for all policymaking from zoning to street utilization, even to policing. So that sounds like a fantastic idea, but um, you know, a great organizing framework is purely theoretical unless we have a specific process, rules in place by which uh, the goals can be communicated, uh, measured, agreed to, and with engagement from communities um, it needs to be codified, it needs to be able to be implemented, it needs to be tracked. Um, if we can't measure something, then we don't know what we're doing. We, can't, we don't know if we're doing better or worse. Um, so with this in mind, we at Envelope have been doing a lot of thinking. You and I, Cindy, have done a bunch of writing on this. Um, and we're thinking about how planning for new development and the public approval process in New York City has been going of late. And um, the verdict is that it has not been going so well. And actually, none of the stakeholders are actually benefiting from the process. It's not just shifted and there's not just an imbalance in one direction. Um, if you look at the, you know, Amazon HQ2 or Industry City, um, there's been a ton of uh, protests against, against uh, proposed uh, developments or rezonings. Uh, there's this us versus them mentality. Um, it becomes hyper-localized and it really takes away from the possibility of planning a better city for the long term. Uh, trust gets reduced and uh, there's an increased burden on developers and communities feel like they're not being listened to. It, it's, it's a complicated process that ends up uh, leaving no one particularly happy. Um, and it just, it doesn't need to be that way. Um, so we have some recommendations. Um, and number one is to implement a master planning process for the whole city. That does not exist today. Uh, many municipalities require it. New York City does not. Um, there is no master plan for New York um, and we should have one. This will allow the mayor and the city council to do a bunch of things. First of all, we could set long range goals for the city on a variety of topics. Um, they could be specific to number, amount of carbon emissions or amount of green space or affordable housing or miles of dedicated bike lanes or miles of dedicated bus lanes um, to you know, number of new subway stations or new mile, amount of miles of subway track or um, really any measurable uh, outcome that we want. We could set goals and we should be setting goals to achieve that over the, over the long term. Um, right. And it's kind of amazing that we don't have this. You know, we have to set goals in some ways, right? I mean, for the Paris Climate Accords, we kind of agreed to do this ourselves as a city. Um, and it's very hard to get anything done if you don't have a goal that you can effectively communicate and get everybody behind. It, it's, it, it's shocking and uh, has actually led to a lot of the frustrations that exist in the planning and development process today um, where a project is proposed and it just becomes all about that project specifically. Again, it becomes hyper-localized and um, the, it, it, the, the discussion loses any lar larger context. There's no big picture discussion. Does this fit into our goals? How does this advance you know, issues of, of, of bike lanes or affordable housing for the city as a whole. And um, that's a real shame. It's a loss for all of us. Um, and, and creating a master planning process will allow us to work with uh, local community boards to plan how those large goals are achieved specifically on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, right? Neighborhoods are different. We're trying to create a 15 minute city, but not each neighborhood needs to be identical. Each neighborhood has its own needs, its own strengths, its own challenges. 
Um, and so we can have these larger goals that are then addressed specifically on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Um, we would need to codify, communicate, and fully fund the plan also. Um, and that would set it up for success with an ongoing public process tracking system. Um, what this would do really, um, in addition to just setting goals for our city and having a specific way to implement those goals is it would minimize um, the end stage public approvals process, uh, which today is the unfortunately named EULER, uh, the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure um, for non as of right new developments. We could still have requests for that, but they would be minimized. And as long as they are um, proposing something that broadly fits within the goals, it, it, it really eases the process because you could point to something and say, we are following the plan. And um, you know, if the development doesn't meet this requirement, uh, there could be a, an approvals process that would get you there uh, and would uh, have buy-in from the community. Um, right, so and the, idea, the idea is kind of to front load all of the planning and all of the engagement um, from the very beginning stages of, of a developer wanting to do something, which ensures that toward the end of the process, um, the community doesn't involved and it's more of a you know there there's much more certainty that the whole thing will be approved and move forward absolutely it front loads the process and it also creates a lot of buy-in from the community from experts in the field um you know and we're not alone in seeing the problem in fact the the speaker of the city council corey johnson possibly having heard our clarion call from the writing we did about this earlier this year uh recently put out a report calling for a total overhaul of how we plan our city, starting with a master plan. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have to know here that any progress toward a 15 minute city will actually make things worse if we don't set equity of access as a primary goal. Um, we need to identify areas of abundance and areas of need prioritize investments in neighborhoods, infrastructure, and services that are lacking. Um, we need to think through a lens of social justice that's critical. It's the only way to do things going forward. It, it's, it's a requirement. Uh, the 15 city, minute city um, concept is absolutely compatible with that. Uh, the good news is that um, we now can use the city's abundant data and mapping tools to ensure equity of quality, accessibility, and accountability for progress. Right, so we've got this great framework uh, for the 15 minute city. We've got a now, you know, we sort of conceived of this more practical um, and visionary mechanism for planning execution and measurement of progress. Um, and so we should talk a little bit about some of the specific policy proposals that we've made over the year that uh, would need to be enacted in order to sort of pave the way for the concept to materialize. Um, all of the proposals we've made are around the more efficient use or reuse or adaptation of our incredibly valuable, incredibly limited physical space. You've got a fairly small city, um, you know, from a square footage perspective, you've got an awful lot of people stacked on top of each other. And, um, we need to figure out how to more effectively use the space between the walls of our buildings um, and the public spaces like our streets and sidewalks. So specifically the policies we've looked at cover three big things. One is reimagining our shared public spaces, streets and sidewalks to accommodate as many people as possible to do what they wanna do. Um, the second is adapting and reusing existing building space for multiple uses. And the third is, and this is a little bit on the kind of in the outer boroughs, um, on the outskirts of the city, it's creating density in these low density sort of suburban style neighborhoods that currently can't support a 15 minute concept because there aren't enough people to be able to sustain you know, vibrant commercial streets. Right, so what we're doing is we're just taking a look at um, sort of the situation on the ground and figuring out how best to improve it with these goals in mind. Right, exactly. So with COVID and the open streets movement and the now permanent outdoor dining program where streets were actually closed off to cars, 
um, taught us a lot and it taught us that we can very quickly reimagine our existing public spaces today if we have a little bit of political will, a little bit of scrappiness, some light design guidelines and a willingness to allow local businesses to sort of um, zoom through what historically has been a pretty cumbersome and maybe expensive permitting process. Yes, the, um, uh, if you would have a year ago suggested the open streets movement and the outdoor dining program, people will tell you it's not possible, it'll take years to implement, it'll take years to get the approvals, but uh, the, the crisis created this opportunity. That's right. And we have a moment to continue. We're still in the crisis. We can continue to capitalize on it. Um, so in New York, the result has been some really terrific examples of, I think, joyful, walkable um, commercial corridors where people are coming together. They're throwing out picnic, picnic blankets in the middle of the street. They're um, sitting at restaurants and doing outdoor dining and commuting in ways that feel very important. So they feel important both to our economic recovery because these people are out shopping and dining and, and uh, you know, spending money. And it also feels important for mental health because people are coming together outdoors and in a sort of safe distanced way that can, um, you know, th these ideas are important, not only in times of crisis, but going forward, you know, and they can really start to lay the groundwork for a full on 15 minute city. Um, hidden as a benefit in the open streets movement. Um, and it's a secondary benefit, but it's quietly uh, doing something incredibly important is that the program reduced on-street parking by over 10,000 parking spaces. That's amazing. It's amazing. And it's, uh, you know, if the mayor of New York had announced that he was going to just take away 10,000 parking spaces, the city would have risen up, um, you know, car owners would have protested in the streets. They, they would have taken to the streets, absolutely. It, it, it would have been mayhem. It would have been unacceptable to even fathom. There would be no political will for that. No one would be willing to touch it. That's right. Uh, and so this was the first step in what should be a much bigger parking reduction program. And so, um, so why do we need a parking reduction program? Why, do, why does this matter? So we were digging into the numbers this year and we were shocked to learn that New York City, which is one of the most public transit rich cities in the country, has over 3 million on street, almost entirely free to anyone parking spaces for just over 2 million registered reg resident vehicles. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, 3 million parking spaces in our public streets that New York City just gives away for free. Um, and so when you start to do the math, uh, a parking space is required to be 180 square feet minimum. And if you multiply that up by 3 million parking spaces, you get about uh, 540 million square feet of parking or the equivalent of 19 square miles of private car storage. And That's these are- in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. It is a city in and of itself, at least a big town. Um, this is, these are for private metal boxes, you know, private vehicles that are used on average about 5% of the time. So, you know, it's a, as a concept, it's a wildly inefficient and frankly unequal because cars are expensive and, you know, maintaining cars are expensive. And so this is likely to be benefiting people who have more money than others. Um, you know, it's an un inefficient and unequal use of public space. Yep. So the real problem though, is that having abundant parking induces demand for driving. It's a little bit like the concept of adding a traffic lane to make traffic flow more easily actually serves to attract more cars, which makes traffic congested again. Um, the same concept holds with parking. So um, the cheaper and easier it is to park, the more appealing it is to drive, the more people buy cars, and the more negative externalities you end up 
piling up in the form of pollution, noise, and traffic fatalities. As someone who grew up in the suburbs of New York City, um, that couldn't be more clear to me, right? It, knowing that there was, if, 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 if I felt like there was an easy way to park, we would drive into the city. Um, if it was going to be free, uh, unbelievably, there was no, no question, but if, if it was gonna be expensive or hard to park, we would take the bus. There's, there's just, it's very straightforward, absolutely free or cheap and available parking induces a demand for driving. There's no doubt about it. That's right. And simultaneously, you're reducing revenue from the public transit system. Yep. And so had you taken the train into the city, you each would have paid a couple of bucks and that would have gone toward, you know, maintaining, improving, expanding the public transit system, um, which ultimately, you know, feeds into all sorts of positive externalities with climate reduction climate change reduction and so forth. So, you know, a major, what this means is that a major priority of the 15 minute city, if indeed we care about making our streets greener and bike and pedestrian and even micro mobility friendly, it has to be to discourage driving. Um, and we can start to do this by ch charging, you know, market rates, maybe garage level rates for on-street parking or even better by systematically removing parking spaces from the city each year. You know, you can set a plan, you can say, here's the percent of parking we're removing each year, we're just going to do it. And, um, you know, you need a little political will and it can be done. But again, in creating targets and having a plan and then making uh, concrete steps to achieving that plan is critical. That's right. So it turns out that New York City is the only major city in the US that doesn't have resident parking permits for on-street parking. Um, this is a legacy of the original power broker, um, the notorious Robert Moses, who made drivability and car accommodations one of the centerpieces of his plan for New York City in, in the 1950s. Um, you know, shockingly, and as a zoning company, we know this, um, kind of intuitively, but the zoning code also requires additional off-street parking to be built for almost every new building that goes up. So um, Eldad, do you want to talk just a little bit about some of those numbers? Like, yes, in I mean, uh, there are requirements in the zoning code for residential and commercial and manufacturing buildings to provide additional minimum parking requirements. Um, we have found by our calculations that uh, this adds roughly another over 2 million parking spaces that are required based on the existing buildings in the city today. Um, that is just uh, so much parking and creating that kind of demand for parking um, again, just then creates a demand for driving. Uh, it's expensive. It raises up the cost of housing. Um, it, it makes affordable housing high, high, harder to build, uh, more expensive, and just can, creates all these additional negative externalities. Right. So combined with on-street parking, again, at 180 square feet per space, um, combined with on-street parking, New York City dedicates square footage that's about the size of the city of Miami to private vehicle storage. It's ridiculous. Uh, so we recommend also instead of just removing on-street parking, we also recommend that zoning include parking maximums rather than minimums. So you shouldn't be allowed to build more than X amount of parking if you're building a new development because we're trying to reduce demand for parking. One of the greenest ways you can change a zoning code very simply is just look at the parking regulations in any city and just flip the word minimum to maximum. It's very simple. It's being done in other places, and we should absolutely do it here, too. That's right. Um, as, and then a final note about street space. We touched on this a minute ago, but we still need to be investing very heavily in public transit, even as we're asking folks to walk and bike most days. So instead of thinking about how to increase the flow of people into and out of the central business district of, say, Manhattan every day, which, um, by the way, doubles the total population of Manhattan daily on, uh, on work days, Monday through, Monday through Friday. 
And we need to start thinking about how to get people quickly, greenly and efficiently from one neighborhood to another. So this is more about creating a mesh network of transit options. Um, you know, we're envisioning, for instance, dedicated lane bus, a bus, a dedicated lane bus rapid transit system with fully green, low noise, comfortable vehicles of different sizes to scale to the populations that may be taking those vehicles at any given moment to get people where they need to go quickly so that you're not trapped in your neighborhood. You know, the idea of having a 15 minute city doesn't mean that you should always be in your little village. Um, it should still mean that you can take advantage of the, uh, you know, cultural opportunities and uh, the, the, the phenomenal neighborhoods we have, um, but you should be able to get there directly and, and uh, efficiently. 100%. We're looking to create a, a city of neighborhoods. Um, okay, so we've talked about outdoor space for shared use, um, but I and we have also been thinking about how we should reuse and adapt existing building spaces to allow for multiple uses. Um, we need to encourage the reuse of our physical plant for many different purposes throughout the week and even throughout the day. Uh, the same site might be a school on weekdays and a synagogue or a house of worship on weekends and a town hall community meeting space in the evenings. Um, we need to be flexible about our space and allow for flexibility. Um, you know, allowing the and extending the capacity of uh, existing neighborhoods and residential neighborhoods for a variety of uses. Um, we could think about underutilized uh, ground floor retail space on commercial streets. There's a lot of that, and there may be a lot more of that coming forward. Uh, those can be repurposed for uh, neighborhood appropriate light manufacturing spaces like hatteries, and chocolatiers, and all kinds of sort of smaller scale, but still what we might classify as a manufacturing or industrial uses, but that are neighborhood appropriate. Um, we need to think about allowing more office space on ground floor retail spaces throughout our neighborhoods and um, other uses like last mile delivery facilities. Um, we need to think about extending our commercial overlays. Again, working towards a much more mixed use, flexible community. Um, uh, we need to extend these overlays to the ends of blocks on all of our residential streets. Um, and then we've talked about this in the past, but we must modernize our manufacturing zoning regulations. Um, manufacturing and industrial uses are different than they were 100 years ago, and they're even actually different than they were 20 years ago. In our zoning code, the language uh, associated with manufacturing and industrial uses does not reflect that. Um, it doesn't talk about last mile. Those, that doesn't exist. You know, cannabis doesn't exist in the zoning resolution, but a bunch of old, um, essentially not relevant terms are still defined and prominent in the zoning resolution. That needs to change. Um, so allowing uh, residential and light manufacturing and R&D and other non-traditional uses into our um, central business districts is another way to sort of help the recovery, right? Our central business districts are suffering and we need to think about how we can quickly and safely uh, help them survive. Um, and of course, if, um, sorry. go ahead, Cindy. Just to jump in for a minute, you know, we have just gone through a moment where it became abundantly clear that we need to repatriate much of our supply chain. So we need to start thinking about how we can manufacture things right here in New York City, like we did 100 years ago, um, to be able to serve the city and the populations around the city. Um, and that could be things like vertical farming. It could be things like um, developing medical supplies or medical equipment that we were, you know, we were so vulnerable during the pandemic because we didn't have the capacity ourselves to be able to make our own PPE. Um, so 100%. And, and, you know, we don't often think about it in this way when we say we need to boost manufacturing, but zoning plays a part in that, where we allow it, where we incentivize it, where we forbid it. Um, all plays a big role in that. And uh, if we're being honest, uh, work from home for knowledge workers has been possible and even desirable for decades. And um, the effectiveness of working from home was obvious right away from day one of the pandemic. And it's even more clear now. 
um, it's here to stay in some capacity. Uh, there will be a lasting and permanent drop in demand for office space. Um, there, there will be a return to work to offices, but it will not return to what it was. Um, and we need to be prepared for that and plan and adapt uh, to allow our cities to, to thrive. Uh, the way to deal with this is to allow for easier conversions of commercial buildings to residential and other uses. Um, we have some language in the zoning code that allows that today, but we need to be more specific, more uh, uh, broad in the regulations and more flexible. Um, incentivizing adaptive reuse for building spaces uh, that aren't performing or relevant in a 15 minute city is uh, critical. We can use zoning to incentivize these changes. Um, this can be in the form of bonuses or tax exemptions or other carrots for developers and new tenants. Um, and then the other thing we talked about earlier this year, uh, which is critical, um, is the idea that we need to upzone the uh, incredibly low density neighborhoods in New York City. There are neighborhoods that allow for single family zoning uh, in New York City, these R1 and R2 zoning districts. Uh, they should be eliminated. Uh, you know, oftentimes there'll be uh, protests against a big development and say that's out of context, but really what's out of context is single family zoning in New York City. It doesn't make sense. Other cities have done it, we should do it too. Yeah, so taken together as a package, if you're thinking about the 15 minute city or the city of villages, the effects of all of these policies if properly implemented should work for everybody. And I mean everybody, you know, we've had such a chronic problem, I think, in our history of only giving nice things to the wealthy neighborhoods. And um, if we do this right, we will have ultimately a pretty radical greening of the city. So moving more quickly toward our goal of zero carbon emissions or, car or carbon neutral city, um, we will certainly, because we'll be walking and biking everywhere, have improved physical activity, um, and health that comes along with that and safety for residents because we'll have minimized vehicle transit. Um, we should have, along with these ideas, an increased access to ec economic opportunity as our neighborhoods become more complete. So anybody who lives in that neighborhood should be able to find a place to work fairly nearby. And then ultimately, and you know, again, this came out of the pandemic, but we should be feeling a deeper, more evolved sense of family and community as we're able to spend more time in our immediate surroundings um, with the people we love. Yes, so um, it sounds fantastic. We can do it. There are specific ways to get there. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, hit us up with questions, thoughts, disagreements, and of course, if you have any need for zoning services, we'll be here. Uh, Cindy and I want to wish everyone a happy new year, and um, the best is yet to come. Happy new year, everybody. Thank you.